Hey internet homies, it is Nico, and campaign one of A Fool's Quest is officially over. But we didn't want to end it on uh, on that last note, so we kind of wanted to give you some closure around some of the characters and NPCs that are out there in the world. This episode is kind of an epilogue episode. The, the players all contributed to their own stories and their own epilogues, and uh, we built a world to kind of line up what might come later in later campaigns. So, like always, thank you so much for listening. I hope that you enjoyed the story as much as we enjoyed playing it. And I guess I should stop rambling and we can dive into the epilogues. Here is the first one. Hush Von Eggers. Ada turned to glide hurriedly down the stairwell. Hush. Is the rift secure? I think that thing is... That was when she saw it. Ada saw the vacant stare of a lifeless body falling in what seemed like slow motion and freefall all at the same time. Duchesne's corpse unceremoniously collapsed to the ground, with only a wet slap against the stone floor to signal the finality of it all. Hesh! You idiot! Ada loosed two arrows into Hesh's leg and shoulder. What did you do? Her eyes quickly caught Hesh's before refocusing on Duchesne's now cooling corpse. Ada felt warm, <laughs> white streams trail her face and fall from her chin. She couldn't tell if her vision had blurred from the tears or from rage, or from both. Her teeth clenched so tightly that Carlos thought they might very well shatter. <laughs> Ada hadn't noticed that she had fired three more arrows into Hesh's torso. In the same way, she wasn't aware that she had been walking toward the rift or toward Hesh. In the listless haze, the catastrophic fall, where everything ceased to make sense, she had been carried forward. Ada soon closed the distance and stood but a step away from Duchesne. Daddy! Her focus was broken. Ada's gaze drifted to Carlos as he soared past her toward Hesh. She saw Hesh's face. His stupid face, dawning an euphoric look. A look so infuriating, she would swear he was almost content, even peaceful. And in the briefest of moments, as a spark from a flint, she saw it slide across his face. It was that smirk, that smug, disgusting, stupid half-smile he did when he was oh so proud of himself. No more. (coughs) An arrow sliced Hesh's cheek before careening into the portal behind him. Another punched into his chest. Two more streaked by as Hesh was sent backward. His body was now being consumed by the rift as two more arrows fired past him. Potentia Luta, a Nino Grumpet. Daddy! No! Two more of her signature arrows found a home in Hesh's abdomen before he and Carlos embraced allowing the rift to engulf them both. A crackle, a hissing, and a snap. And then, just like that, the rift had vanished. With it went her beloved Carlos, that son of a bitch Hesh, and any hopes of answers or, more importantly, proper revenge. Hesh seemed to have gotten off easy once again, she thought. Leaving with Carlos, a quick death, and that stupid smoke on his dumb face. He took her best friend from her, stolen her Carlos, and left her with only rage and sorrow. Hesh may have seemed victorious as he fell into the portal, but that isn't how people will remember him. Oh no, not if Ada could help it. 
Every chance, every word, every story will let the world know just how much of a piece of shit he really was. His smug smirk may be burned into her mind, frozen in that moment of shock and betrayal, but she will burn the image of Hesh into the world as a cowardly, selfish villain. Hesh floats in silence. The blood from his wounds begins to fill his lungs. His eyes shift from left to right to inspect his surroundings. Is this the in-between? Or the endless void that is controlled by his otherworldly masters? Doesn't matter. He feels his back come to rest upon a hard surface. He doesn't see ground or floor. Just the endless black. We're just taking death so long to visit him. He completed his task. Footsteps begin to echo from somewhere. Everywhere. Nowhere. A man steps up to Hesh's side and leans over. Oh, Hesh. You look like you've seen better days. Don't try to speak. The blood is already in your lungs, and you wouldn't make much sense anyway. Your patron, as you call him, has a specific plan for you, and I am here to make certain that plan continues as designed. Oh yes, I know all about your patron. He has many names, but most simply refer to him as the Herald of Haster. The Heralds of the Old Ones live outside the realm of time, but all of them have earned their place by playing a key role in the designs of their gods. And now it is time for you to take your place among the Heralds. You see, Hesh, your patron, the Herald of Haster, is actually you. Your older, eternal, ascended self. You always played the role of Herald to Francis and Ada. This is and has always been your nature. You are, and have always been, the Herald of Haster. Now, if you finish dying... I would like you to follow me. Your shepherd's crook and robe await you. Hesh could feel the blood in his lungs, but it no longer mattered. Breathing was a concern for mortal men. Hesh slowly pushed himself to his feet. With Ada's arrows still sticking out of his body, he wordlessly followed the man to an elevator that seemed to exist from nowhere. He stepped into the strange lift and leaned against the side wall. Going down. Epilogue. The World of Euphray. Tim, Terry, and Tiana completed their calling imprisoning Greyhawk in the space between universes. Once again, the only god that was allowed direct access to the world of Euphray was Salune, the one god that seemingly wants nothing to do with this universe. Tim, Terry, and Tiana were never seen in Euphray again. Samantha, their adopted mother, commissioned stone statues to be built in their honor. The statues were funded by Ingvald Porter Altbeer and were placed on the coast in the city of Rilius. The few Euphraeans that knew of the three halflings and their sacrifice traveled to the city to pay their respects. Most in the world would never know. The efforts of the three halflings proved fruitful in closing all the current rifts between universes. While the western part of Euphray mostly had portal connections with the Nine Hells and the Outer Worlds, all twelve neighboring universes had touched Euphray at some point. The portals were now closed, but creatures, people, and entities from all the other twelve universes had found their way into Euphray. With the portals closed, none of them have a way to return to their rightful universes. Roving bands of demons, aberrations, and other types of monsters now travel the planet. The Global Adventurers Guild, Master Enterprise, was forcefully dissolved in most regions shortly before the global fallout from Greyhawk and Duché. 
Many judges had ordered executions of guild members, and the cities were inclined to carry out the orders without question. After the attacks on the cities, the general population realized that the Adventurers Guild was the only group strong enough to combat these monsters. They blamed the judges for the death of the guild members. Many judges, in turn, were soon put to the sword. Thus ended the Age of Judges. The majority of Master Duché's operatives were in the godless realm when the portals closed. The few operatives that remained attempted to put together an anti-guild brigade. They were met with resistance and anger. Soon, they slipped back into the shadows and began a new cult. This cult is now called the Duché Brigade Against Guilds. They are often referred to as D-Bags for short. The magic book was separated as it was transported back to Euphray. Each page was split from the others and appeared in a random part of the world. The book's separation caused a fallout in the world of Euphray. When each page separated from the magic book, so did each school of magic from the others. Magic users lost all access to magic, with the exception of one specific school. These new rules to magic severely crippled the magic community, and threw many magic users into severe states of depression or madness. Many magic users became recluses. The only exception to the one school rule of magic revolved around warlocks. Because their magic comes from outside the known universe, they were able to maintain access to multiple schools of magic. However, many of the warlock patrons were angered by the disruption to the multiverse, and since dissolved their pacts with their warlock servants. Each infinite page was quickly found and brought before royal figures or individuals in power. New forms of government blossomed throughout the world. Alliances were reforged out of necessity to combat the outworldish invaders. Kingdoms, democracies, and republics were founded with an infinite page at the center of power. So began the Fourth Age, known as the Age of Academics, which soon will lead to the Scholastic Wars. In more local events, Charles Edward Cheese helped lead the city of Cheddar to victory over the Demon Horde. What the city at first thought was a secondary invasion from the Goliath and Tortle forces turned out to be a miracle in disguise. The Demon Horde was tearing the city apart, and a rat folk named Splinter ordered his forces to enter the city and fight back the Demon Horde. After the Demon Horde was repelled, Charles returned to find the guild barracks completely destroyed. He found the rest of his surviving guild members and dissolved the Cheddar chapter of the Adventurers Guild. Because of his dedication to the city and acts of heroism, Judge Bri Asiago offered him the role of captain of the city guard. Charles grudgingly accepted the offer and began the arduous process of rebuilding a city in ruins. In the Half Shell Pirate Brewing Company, Not Mike and Large Marge were able to protect Ingvald's bar during the chaos. Above the bar, next to the shield, now sits a portrait of Tim, Terry, and Tiana, hung in honor to the three halflings. During the rebuilding of Cheddar, this bar became one of the most popular locations to grab dinner and a beer for all the construction workers that toiled away during the day. To this day, the basement remains rat-free. Abigail the Wanderer returned to her own bar in the city of Seaforge. During the chaos, Seaforge sustained some damages from extraplanar attacks, but overall, the city fared better than most. She was home for only one day before a man carrying a scimitar with nine runes on the blade walked into the tavern and challenged her to a duel. When Abigail declined, the man attacked and began raving about a journal. Abigail not only survived the attack, but she was able to disarm and detain the madman without taking his life. After investigating the scimitar, 
Abigail decided to do something she hadn't done since Cody, or Thorkillen as he's now called, bound Magno Odd. She bound the Nine Lives Scimitar to Tiana's journal. These bonds are not as strong as the core item bonds to the First People, but the connection between the blade and Tiana's journal would last forever and could be passed from wielder to wielder. Whoever carried the Nine Lives Scimitar would be obligated to protect Tiana's journal. Once she completed the ritual, she packed the blade and book into a crate and shipped it to Magno Odd in the Blinding Bay. She left a note inside the crate saying, Magno, you will know who to entrust this to and why. Thank you. She shipped the crate on the next ship that was heading north. Epilogue Ada the Drow Rogue Hesh was gone. Ada stood, rooted in place for what seemed like hours, stewing in her hatred for the man that just killed her best friend. Then she felt a hand grip her shoulder. Out of instinct, she pulled the slap dagger from her wrist and put it to the throat of the man that was grabbing her. Sebastian. Ada returned the dagger to her wrist and knelt down next to Duche. She placed a hand on his chest, closed her eyes, and whispered, I'm sorry. Ada. Sebastian uses her name to get her attention. We need to get Master Francis to a cleric. The two pull Francis to his feet, one arm over each shoulder. They learn that the wounded are being taken to the Half-Shell Pirate Brewing Company, so they turn in that direction. As they approach the building, several men come to take Francis inside to be seen by a cleric. As a bard slides from her grasp, Ada slips a small white piece of paper into his pocket. Francis, this is goodbye. I knew this day would come, so I prepared this in advance. Thank you for all the adventures and dangers we got into, even if most of the time it wasn't necessary. Thieves can emoji for week. Don't forget about the collab out there floating somewhere. I assume Hesh is dead because, I mean, why wouldn't he be? Your friend, Ada. P.S. Please burn after reading. P.P.S. I'm sorry. Ada didn't believe Hesh was dead, but she didn't want Francis to be the one to find him if he went looking. If Hesh was alive, she was going to be the one to find him, and then she delivered vengeance for Duche. But before she could do that, there were a few things that needed doing first. Ada and Sebastian headed to Splinter's tent. She knew she could send a Chagall to Nana. The note read, This will be my last letter. Hope all is well. I'm sorry. After seeing the Chagall take flight, the pair headed into the city to try to find Try It Derp. He had offered Dolly a job. She was going to use that job to search for evidence of Hesh's fate. The other end of that rift may have been on Euphre. Dolly and Sebastian worked as bounty hunters and mercenaries for years. The name Ada faded from use, except an occasional whisper from Sebastian. Over the years, Dolly met a few drow while in the Underdark. After establishing a relationship with them, most of Dolly's spending was on other drow slaves that she would then return to the people. Dolly spent the next 25 years adventuring all over Euphre, searching for signs of Hesh and finding none. Eventually, Sebastian became too old to follow Dr Dolly, so they retired to a small cottage deep in the forest of Ebedine. The years rolled on. Then one day, that cottage was empty. One grave in the back, the headstone read, Sebastian. Epilogue, Thorkillen Thorkillen, also known as Cody, walks through a small jail cell in Ravia. His sword is strapped to his belt, a weight he has chosen not to bear for a very long time. He stops in front of the cell of Axiom, one of the few remaining First People. Axiom says, It is done. I can feel it. My children were successful in their endeavor. Thorkillen responds, Yes, they were. However, the gaps between Greyhawk's attempts to return are growing shorter. It is time that we put a stop to all this before we can no longer imprison him. It is time to collect those that remain of our people and end these cycles. By my calculation, we have maybe five or six hundred years to prepare. Thorkillen unlocks a cell using a specific key and then opens the door. Axiom watches silently as Thorkillen takes a gavel from his pack 
and sets it on the floor of the cell. Thorkillen says, You know that I'm right. We must find the others. We must be better prepared. No more excuses. Axiom stands from his chair in his prison and walks over to collect the gavel from the floor. He feels the warmth and energy pass through him as his fingers touch his core item. Axiom has always been willing to do what it takes. To him, it has been an annoyance that the rest of the First People took so long to come to the same logical conclusion. Thorkillen says, It's time to put our differences aside. And with a quick wave of his hand, he opens a portal just outside the jail cell. Just before he steps through, he places his hand on Axiom's shoulder and says, The age of judges is over. Welcome to the new age. The two ancient beings step through the portal. Epilogue The Heroes The world is a different place now. The age of judges and the widespread influence of Gagne has come to an abrupt close. Few know of how close the realms actually came to ruin, and fewer still know the stories of those involved in its restoration. Magic is not the same, and Euphray must adjust accordingly. In the days following the battle with Duché, Nalfeda returned to Cheddar to aid in the restoration of the city. He did, after all, contribute to its destruction, both by the portal backlash which destroyed a third of the city, and by not reaching Zariel's horde in time to take command of them in the Charbosi Desert. His former guildmates welcomed his aid when he returned, and the townsfolk were pleased to see him and his companions. Malfader sent a Chagall to Gaiden to notify his mother, the Lady Therese, of his safe homecoming. And after some heartfelt goodbyes, the heroes parted ways. Ingvald to his brewery, and Sir Thaddeus to, well, whatever living liches do with time on their hands. Upon returning to Gaiden, the son of Donato Bromroyo assumed his birthright as head of the Bromroyo Trades Guild, with his mother close at his side. As a first order of business, he commissioned the Guild of Dwarven Stonemasons to help rebuild Cheddar. He then turned his attention to upgrading his guild vaults. With first-hand knowledge of the most secure and inner workings of the Collective, and seeing the measures that Thorkillen himself installed, inspired him to gather the finest guild engineers to not only rebuild his damaged family vaults, but make them even more protected and secure. Shortly after his return, Malfader visited Monsignor Gorgonzola of the Church of Greyhawk. Not wanting to endure more controversy and to clear his name with the church, Mal assumed his Asimar radiant soul form, no longer tainted by darkness and no longer bound to a princess of the Nine Hells. Malfader persuaded the clergy and salvaged the rapport with his former mentor. Gorgonzola was very willing to absolve him of his transgressions and ensured his amnesty from the bounties placed on his head by the Conclave of Elders. Malfader considered for a moment explaining the truth he had learned about Greyhawk, but eventually decided that was conversation for another time. Mal had learned that it was Salune who had empowered the priests of Euphray with their healings, prayers, and spells. Although she wanted nothing to do with this realm, she felt obligated to those who sought to do good. Malfader offered restitution at her altars and received the enduring boon of the moon goddess. He would continue to champion the cause of right and good, but like the phases of the moon, his path would wax and wane, his darker side gone, but not forgotten. From his fortified home in Gaiden, he endeavored to form a secret society to aid in safeguarding the legacy and lore of the First People. There would be those at the end of this new age who would seek answers as the realms would once again draw closer. And so, the Cavaliere della Luna Illuminati, the Illuminated Moon Knights, were born. Epilogue, Sir Thaddeus Trevelcock After returning to Euphray, Thaddeus attempts to cast another teleportation circle to return the three adventurers to Cheddar. But the magic doesn't answer. 
He shakes the arthritic ache out of his fingers and tries again. Still nothing. He tries casting hold person on Ingvald. Panic starts to set in. Did he and his friends sever the connection between Euphre and wherever magic is born? He tries once more, casting the first spell he learned. A bolt of fire leaps from his fingers and strikes a tree 20 feet away. Eh, there's still some magic. Thaddeus tucks that thought away and explains the situation to his companions. They march the three days back to Cheddar. They return to find Charles had disbanded the Cheddar chapter after repelling a demon army and had been offered the position of captain of the city guard. Thaddeus stayed in Cheddar for a few days, spending time trading stories and memories with the friends that were still around. After he left Cheddar, he went to Rilius for a few years, locking himself in a small cottage at the edge of town to study. He had learned in the first week after returning from the godless realm, nobody could access more than one school of magic. He spent years poring over books. Eventually, the noise from the city growing around him became too much of a distraction. He packed all of his belongings into his bag of holding and headed out into the wilderness. He wished for as close to immortality as he could get, and he was determined to figure out what he had done to break magic. Epilogue Engvald Porter Altbeer Duché had slipped through their fingers, but they had done what they had set out to do. He wasn't a god, and they had reminded him at the very least that he was still very, very mortal. Upon returning to Cheddar, Ingvald surveyed the destruction of the city and was quite relieved to learn that his bar was still standing. The guild house was basically leveled, but the bar was still standing. Not Mike and Large Marge had done an amazing job at safeguarding the establishment, and Ingvald wasted no time in brewing a new celebratory beer, a crisp and clean amber wheat ale with hints of green apple. But Ingvald had another reason to celebrate, too. Samantha, the adoptive mother to Tim and Terry, was with child. Seems the dwarf could not only brew beer in a barrel, but could put little buns in an oven. As tokens of affection and to commemorate their bravery, he commissioned statues of the three halfling heroes to be placed in Rilius, and portraits to be hung in places of honor on the walls of the brewery, next to Mikey's shell. He then divided his time between his growing business and to his growing family. His son was born fat and happy and with a head full of hair. Ingvald named him Pilsner Altbeer, after his great-grandfather, but as the lad grew rowdy and uncommonly strong, he just called him Stout. Ingvald's business kept him traveling quite a bit, promoting his latest creations throughout Western Euphra. His days of adventuring had nourished a wide variety of markets. He hated being away from his family, mostly, but he knew that his old companion had taken up residence in Rilius, at least for a time, and that Uncle Thaddeus wouldn't let anything happen to Samantha and Pilsner. Epilogue M.C. Nasley Imprisoned for the death of the Gagme Guild leader Emaya Real Questlinger, McNasley wasn't going to simply endure his sentence. That would be extremely boring. He broke off a piece of the wooden cot in his cell and began shaping it with care and precision. No, he wasn't making a shank for the guard or a fork for his dinners. Gnawing it with his teeth and forming airways with his horns, he fashioned a makeshift kazoo. He would kazoo songs of lament to express his sadness or a happy little ditty to liven his spirits. When the demon horde arrived and began laying waste to the city, he wondered if this was indeed the final verse in his great masterpiece of a life. Amidst the commotion, he heard the sounds of kazoo outside his window. Ropes were fashioned to the bars of his cell window, and with the neighing of horses, they were ripped from their settings, along with a good portion of the wall. With two graceful hops, he was free. He grinned devilishly when he saw who had come to his rescue. It was Romy Goat and Hoovia. Come on, 
We gotta get out of here. This town's gone to hell. Carefully and stealthily escaping the city amidst the battle of two armies, the trio scampered into the wilderness. They could now continue to raise their army of kazoo-wielding satyrs. Hopefully somewhere far away from loud noises. God damn it! Epilogue. Loki. Wait, what? Loki sits in the mansion of Dionysus. One of old D's servants steps inside and delivers a letter to Loki. Loki is not only taken the form of Dionysus, but he's also taken full advantage of his servants. It feels nice. The god taps his fingers on the arm of the chair as he considers the letter. He's been playing the part of Dionysus for a while now, at least since he tricked that Thaddeus Treblecock character into getting that wish spell for him from the vaults. The sorcerer even made the wish exactly how Loki had told him to. It was almost too easy. With a smirk, he cracks the seal on the letter and reads the contents. Huh. It appears the battle for Euphray is dormant again, at least for a short while. Greyhawk has been put back in his prison and the rifts were once again closed. Loki never really cared for old Greyhawk's realm. But the fact that Salune was the only deity allowed access and no one else was, well, that really annoyed him. And now that the chaos was over, it was time for Loki to fix that. Using the pocket watch that the sorcerer had wished into existence for him, Loki dropped his guys. Ugh, felt so good to be out of the skin of Dionysus, that man, and activated the magic item. The pocket watch hummed with magic energy, and the portal that gave backdoor access to the world of Euphray came into existence. Loki grabbed an apple from a nearby fruit tray and then stepped through the portal. Epilogue Francis the Lion Well, howdy there. Sit on down a spell. Barkey, drink from a friend here. I come here to people watch, mostly. Other folks, though, they mostly come here for him. That fellow up there playing the bagpipes. Man to save the world twice. To hear him tell it. See, the most recent time was that whole mess with gag me and those portals. He and his erstwhile companions gathered an army and fought off a great demon. Francis the Lion himself. When all seemed lost, banished it back to the hell it came from. After the battle, though, his comrades turned on each other, one killing the other. He went his own way after that. His own way is the only way he goes these days. Look there, just finished the set. How you doing, Francis? Oh, uh, you know, win some, you lose some. Sure, I got you. Well, take care, man. Gotta get downstairs. Sure. Give him hell, Francis Lion. Oh, yeah. I know that you will. Yeah, well, the lion, I don't know, roars. <laughs> the lion roars. I don't know about you, but I take comfort in that. It's good knowing he's out there. Francis the Lion, winning the fights that others walk away from, roaring into the darkness. Well, that about does it. Wraps her up. Things seem to have worked out pretty well for old Francis the Lion, and now he spends his time in places like this, fighting the good fight, usually in a basement. It was a pretty good story, don't you think? Made me laugh to beat the band. I didn't like seeing Hesh go. I suppose old Carlos still has his Auntie Ada to take care of him. I suppose how this... I suppose that's how this fool's quest keeps perpetuating itself. 
Heroes rise, heroes fall, down through the ages, across the sands of time until we... Ah, look at me, rambling again. Well, I hope you enjoyed yourself. Catch you again later on, down the trail. The End of Campaign One Mad Rose here. <laughs> oh, Hesh, you look like you've seen better days. Don't try to speak. The blood is only... Your blood is only in your lungs. You are and have always been the Herald of Pastor. Now, if you've finished dying, I would like... <laughs> you are and have always been the Herald of Pastor. Now, if you've finished dying, I would like... Motherfucker. You are and have always been the <laughs> motherfucker. Oh, Manrose here. <laughs> you don't have to put that in. <laughs>